Welcome to Cultura Latina. Today we're taking you on a trip to an architectural and landmark jewel in Peru. And also we'll go to Ecuador for a quick look to one of the most impressive and ancient art collections in Latin America. The municipal theater of Lima is one of the most iconic buildings of the Peruvian capital. Totally restored from a fire in 1998, now works as a platform for a wide variety of performing arts. The Municipal Theatre of Lima is one of the architectural jewels of the city. The Municipal Theatre is one of the iconic cultural representations of the city of Lima because it has recovered all the beauty and importance of the city, and above all else because it is one of the first examples of the complete restoration of a monument due to its importance and cultural patrimony. The Municipal Theatre, as we know, was burned in a fire in 1998. Milagros Romero was the chief historian during the reconstruction of the Municipal Theatre of Lima from 2008 to 2010. According to Romero, the cultural importance of the location began long before the construction of the theater. The area in and around this theater was very important. Before the municipal theater was built, there was a barnyard theater here. In 1928, this was converted into the municipal theater, which showcased the best operas because the stage was high quality and there was plenty of room for the audience. Large operas and presentations and the types of performances that take place here. For example, during the government of Augusto Leguía, there were ceremonial lunches and meetings here. The reconstruction of the theater was a massive undertaking. It was the entire work of a team of 3,000 specialists, engineers, electricians, electromechanical specialists, and particularly, restoration people from the School of Fine Arts. You can see all the care and emotion that form part of this unique restoration process. The different sections of the building use an array of classic architectural styles. The Municipal Theatre has a mix of styles. Here, in the hall for the audience, it has Italian Renaissance style, and we see that in the decoration of all the box seats. For example, here we have the presidential suite. Now we are in the principal entrance, which is the lobby, and here we can see the Ionian style of the columns that the restoration has made with a technique for marble, as you can see here. We can also see here the restoration of the stairs that have the imperial style of Louis XVI. We are at the Mirrors Lounge where we see a whole restoration. The work on the chandeliers was also done. This work was performed by a team of five or six people for three months for each chandelier. This is the level of the widow's box. Why is it named like this? because the women that had recently lost their husbands during the first month could not be exposed. They could not be on the streets, but they didn't want to miss the plays of the moment either. And they would come here and see through these little windows the performances that took place in the municipal theater. Now we are at the front entrance that has a monumental facade, and it also has a large illumination at night. It is completely restored. As we can see, it has a neo-baroque style, presented with all the padding aligned in the windows and the columns. The atmosphere set by this piece of Peruvian history helps bring to life some of the most renowned performances in the nation, such as the Festival of Hispanic Arts of Lima and the Afro-Peruvian play Malambo. Built in one of the oldest houses in Quito, the Casa del Lavado or House of the Praise Museum holds one of the largest pre-Columbian art collections in Latin America since 2010. Come see.
built in 1671, this is one of the oldest homes in Quito. It is called the Casa of Alabado due to an engraving on the front door that reads praised, or in Spanish, Alabado be the holy soul. The place became one of Ecuador's premier pre-Columbian art museums in 2010. Well, the museum is part of uh, Fundación Tolita, which is a non-profit uh, organization which is dedicated to housing and protecting a collection of 5,000 pieces, of which 500 are exhibited at the museum permanently. And uh, we also have temporary exhibitions where we change, uh, we do uh, specific research and we use specific pieces. The idea is, uh, well, first to uh, turn the museum into a place where people both from Ecuador and from the rest of the world can appreciate the pieces, can know that they exist and that we have this heritage that comes from pre-Columbian cultures, cultures before the Incas came, cultures before the Spanish came. And uh, we're also interested in conserving these pieces as best as we can because it has been a problem before the fact that uh, many pieces belong to private collections and they are not properly taken care of. So these are the two aspects of the museum, you know, the correct preservation of the pieces and allowing them to be presented to the public and to become part of our cultural identity. The artifacts of the museum range from 4,000 years before current era to 1,500 common era, with an open layout that allows for the artistic aspects of each piece to be fully appreciated. The museum seeks to bring visitors closer to the cosmology of the represented indigenous groups. Uh, there are three main areas in the museum that represent the underworld, which is the world of the ancestors, the world of the dead, and you have the middle world, which is the world of the living, of humans, of plants and animals, and then uh, there is the spiritual world, the world where the gods live and where the shamans transport to when they do their rituals and communicate with the spirits. Expert teams are able to identify the origins of each artifact by researching the materials and methods used for creating sculptures, ceramics, and ritual pieces. If you pay a lot of attention to the name of the culture and how the pieces look like, you're going to be able to make some relationships. For instance, in Chorrera, you're going to start seeing this particular glow in their ceramics that is due to Engobe. And in Hama, you're going to start seeing a lot of details. They're going to pay a lot of attention to ornaments, how clothes are made, how earrings are made. And they're going to have painting also in, in their ceramics. However, the color and the glow that the ceramics are going to have is way more, is way different to, to, to Chorrera. And for instance, you're going to have this also cultures from Tolita and Hama that were, uh, they, they established at the same time and their ceramics therefore kind of look alike. However, Hama is going to have in their sculptures more frontality. Tolita is going to have much more movement. The museum attracted about 28,000 visitors last year alone. Casa Alabado works to educate visitors on what constitutes pre-Columbian artwork and the 15 distinct indigenous cultures of Ecuador, ranging from the coast to the Andes and the Amazon. We also want is that people start looking at this, at these objects for what they are. This, they, they are work of art, and is try to value that Ecuador has also all this identity that comes from a long, long time ago that we actually haven't looked, pay attention to. So what we want is that, for instance, designers could get inspiration about these pieces, that future, um, let's say, architects get and have inspiration of these pieces and, be, and just make uh, all the Ecuadorian production a little bit more local and that has more identity. So I guess, yeah, for, for instance, for us, I think it's important that people learn about these things, but also get a sense of uh, identity. Of the Casa de Alabado is a place for immersion in the pre-Columbian period and supports the cultivation of a sense of national identity by recovering pieces once held in private collections and allowing the public to take in and fully appreciate the artifacts. Thanks for watching. Next week we'll be back with another taste in Latin American culture. See you then.